So uh, once again, I'm really happy to uh, see people in uh, groups for meeting, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentations uh, for the next hour. Um, but in the meantime, we have some material to cover on a topic we started on last time, uh, which was coverage testing. Uh, we talked about how in order to uh, in order to test effectively within a system, we have to invest our time judiciously. We can't test every possible combination. And at the same time, it behooves us to not merely sort of flail and test random things. It behooves us to put our efforts into testing things where they'll secure the greatest bang for the buck, where each hour would be most likely to you know, turn up some, some problems. And we talked over the past few lectures about a couple of techniques designed to do exactly that. We talked about focusing on equivalence classes and maybe having one or two examples from each equivalence class, but making sure we cover the different equivalence classes. So again, rather than just kind of throwing down any sort of test and hoping it shows results, we systematically test things um for each different broad set of cases and if we don't do that you know who knows if we're missing something big right a, a whole test case or two or whole class of issues might might not even be tried and tested if we do try at least a few examples from each we can develop you know some degree of justified um justified confidence that if there are problems, which there are still likely, um, at least we've ruled out some broad, broad types of them. At least the basic, you know, broad possibilities seem to work. We also talked about boundary value testing because often the errors in systems in general, the errors live in the interface. They live not in a case, one clear case or another, but the boundaries between them. That's where people make mistakes. That's where things fall through the cracks. That's where there's duplicated work. I'm speaking in general, but the same thing is true for these equivalence classes. Often we as programmers handle certain broad classes in similar ways. And where we fall flat is often, certainly not always, but often at the, the boundaries between them. Uh, the cases which are kind of corner cases, it's not clear if it's covered by this one or that one without thinking about it. Or we have an off by one error, right? We have an error where we we have the right idea in mind, but we're, we just fall one short. We don't initialize the last element of the array. Or sometimes we go too far in the array, we, we go one beyond the end element or whatever. We don't initialize the zeroth element of the array. It occurs all the time. We have the loop go one, two, few times, whatever it is. Those sort of cases of boundary values come up a lot. So those are examples of cases where we, we try to get the greatest bang for the buck from our testing. We try to test in some sort of principled way. And last time I started talking about coverage testing as another way to do this. The idea is, is fairly simple. It's to try to map out um, a set of structures within our program. Maybe they're screens of our system. Maybe they're web pages within our web app. Maybe they are um, uh, points within an algorithm, particular basic blocks or particular areas of that algorithm. And we try to make sure that we hit all of them. We try to make sure we've achieved coverage of these. That's the basic idea. But it has many particular manifestations. One we're going to be talking about today, and we started on yesterday, yesterday. We started on our previous class on Thursday, and it's probably going to take us another couple lectures to really play it out is what's called path coverage. The idea behind path coverage is, is achieving 
a certain degree of coverage through the paths taken through our system. Again, these paths could be within the system as a whole, you know, trying that ATM machine with an invalid card, with an invalid pin, trying it with an outdated card, trying it with a card whose balance is, is exhausted, trying it with, with a card where, you know, it's already been revoked or been marked as lost. All these are different possibilities in that flow diagram we saw. And we're trying those different paths through the system. Um, but we'll see that this also operates at the level of particular algorithms, code, for example, in the area of white or glass box testing, where we, we understand what the and we started to talk about path coverage with kind of the weakest form of it called node coverage or state coverage. The idea is we, we hit every possible state of the system. And today we're going to build on that because state coverage turns out to offer kind of weak, weak testing. Hey, it's a lot better than not doing coverage testing at all, but it's on the weaker side compared to what we can achieve with some of the more sophisticated ones. Um, uh, transition coverage or edge coverage, it's called. Uh, and uh, coverage that involves edge combinations, but especially uh, something called prime path coverage. Okay. Um, so we're, this is the route we're going. And what we're going to see is that um, far from just being useful techniques, there's uh, formally what's known as a subsumption hierarchy among these. In other words, if you achieve edge coverage, you're guaranteed within certain reasonable assumptions to achieve state coverage. If you achieve edge combination coverage, you've achieved edge coverage. If you achieve uh, the prime path coverage, you've achieved edge coverage. So there's kind of a level, a hierarchy of greater strength that we can we can construct that i'll analogize to some formal hierarchies within computer science when we get to it anyway that's where we're going that's where we've been let's dive into this material okay so we're continuing on our discussion of path coverage we had talked about this atm example and we have talked about the idea of covering these states. So here, you know, the system has these transitions um, under different circumstances, like a card not being recognized, or, you know, a, a card is, has been lost or, or uh, has expired, or an invalid pin is, occurs. But these things in these, these um, sort of rounded rectangles are states of the system. You know, it's waiting for a pen here. There's, here's a state where the user is entering the pen, started typing some of the elements of the pen. Um, here, the card has been ejected and is ready for user pickup, or it's printing a receipt. These are the states that it's in, okay, um, that it can be in. And in a diagram this, uh, such as this, which documents the flow of code, here we're actually looking at, at a much more microscopic level. We're holding up a microscope or a magnifying glass to our code, but we still see these kind of states it can get into where it's figuring out the uh, decoding the hexadecimal values of the system. Um, this is kind of a point in the execution. This is another point in the execution of this program. This is another point in the execution. And conceptually, these are what I call basic blocks from the standpoint of compiler technology, but I won't get into that. So the idea here with coverage procedures that I really want you to internalize, this is like, I'm not sure I've ever taught this class without this being on the internet. So, <laughs> so take note, um, without something directly related to this slide, uh, where anyone who saw this slide would get up there. Percent. So, what are the key steps in the coverage procedure? The idea is look, we identify a set of things we need to cover. Maybe there are nodes, in other words, states of the system. Maybe there are transitions. Maybe there are combinations of transitions. Maybe they are these prime paths 
we're going to see an algorithm to identify. We basically figure out where they are in the program. And then we figure out ways to go through the program from start to finish. Start to finish. Maybe it's the algorithm from start to finish. Maybe it's this system from start to finish. We figure out abstract paths that will get us to those places. So maybe we want to cover all states of this system. And we've got to figure out paths from start to finish that will achieve coverage of all those states. So we know we have to check the eject card state, for example. Okay, we need some sort of path that will get us to this eject card state. Or we say, you know, um, we need to get to that one too, because that one's a different state. This one is hard to recognize. This one is, is marked as a different state because it comes about through totally different circumstances. Or maybe we need to, you know, check out the confiscate card state, make sure it correctly confiscates it, right? It sucks it in uh, inside itself. Um, been there, done that. Um, so this one, we want to, we need to have a, a path from the start that will somehow get it to that state. So we we say, okay, you know, we'll have it go down here, and we'll have it an expired card, and then it will lead it to confiscate the card. Right? That would be one way of sort of getting into that state. That's kind of an abstract path. Okay. That's what I mean by an abstract path, where we say, okay, we'll insert the card, we'll enter a pin, we'll, the pin will be valid, it prompts us for a trans, uh, transaction, we select withdraw, we select the account number, or, you know, account description, and then, you know, we'll, uh, uh, we'll have an account where it's been exceeded, and therefore, the daily amount, and therefore, it goes to this thing. That'd be another kind of abstract path. And it ends up here in the state of flow where the card is ejected. And hopefully you're not ejected. Okay. Um, so those are abstract paths. Okay. That's that's that second step. The third step here is we need concrete test cases. Because what I've just been describing. Is abstract paths. I kind of waved my hands and said, well, you know, we enter a, we, we enter a pin and we we select the account and you know it's it's uh, it exceeded it's exceeded our daily value. And that's all well and good for the abstract paths idea. But now for this final step, we need specifics like particular things that are going to exercise each of those abstract paths. So what's our pin? What is the account, the specifics of the account? By how much has it been, been exceeded? We need specific inputs and outputs we're giving it, or situations at 10. That will be a test case, a fully specified test case. For something like this, a test case would be, well, this is a CGI decode algorithm. It, it's going to take a CGI encoded string, like you see in URLs, you know, with those percent sign, percent five, three, or whatever. Um, and it, it's going to decode it and it's going to put it in this in this uh, buffer here where it's, it puts out the decoding string. That's what this does. And the point is, we need to test it with some particular test cases. So that will be particular encoded strings that will get it to go the way we want it to. So abstract test case will be saying, well, you know, I want it to come down, down here, down here, and it will go like this, and it will come down, and then it will go around, and then we'll pass. That'll be an abstract test case. Great. Very important. That was the second step. But the third step is coming up with specific inputs. You know, give me exactly what this is, because this is what makes it reproducible. This is what makes it defined. This is what allows you know a dev to go 
read the test case that failed and enter the exact same things that see it failed themselves. These are the exact things to enter. And that's what we need to run a specific test case. So that's the third element here. Okay. Um, and it's important to keep these in mind because, like, the concrete test cases might exercise additional paths beyond what you need to cover, what you intended to cover, but that's fine. The point is that these abstract scenarios are covered by the test cases. Okay. Test cases are specific. They are concrete. They are precise. They are reproducible. They, you know, every time if you enter that, you're entering exactly the same input. Whereas the abstract scenarios are the goals that will allow you to cover the things you're hoping to cover. So you want to enumerate the things you want to cover. Maybe it's the states of the system. Maybe it's transitions. Maybe it's these front paths. You want to figure out general ways going through the system that will cover them, and then you figure out particular test cases that will achieve that. Those are the three things. Okay. Give those back to me on the final exam. You'll get full marks. Okay. That's the basic idea. Um, okay. So, Path coverage tests basically allow you to derive legal paths for the program from start to finish. So, exercise the desired level of coverage. When I say desired level of coverage, what I'm talking about is abstract scenarios that cover the things we are seeking to cover, the things identified here. So, you might say, as a team, we want to cover all the states of this algorithm. Or you might say we want to cover, you know, the uh, the front paths. Great. Um, these scenarios here will be covering the front paths, and uh, so they're they're hitting these things that you want you want to hit. Okay, with your with your uh, path coverage, um, and then we're going to go on and find these specific test cases, like particular inputs. Specific inputs, you know, particular name, particular dishes, particular entries for the risk calculator, particular entries for the message in a bottle, whatever. Okay, that's the idea here. So, the coverage procedure will involve these three steps. We're going to be talking about about each of these going forward. Okay. Now, it turns out, as I said, there's this subsumption hierarchy. What I mean by this is there's different levels, at an intuitive level, there's different levels of strength that you can, by which you can cover your system. By strength, I mean you can cover it more completely or less completely. More completely involves often more work on your part, but it would be more thorough. Lower levels be less thorough. Okay. So you'll notice that there's this directed graph. Here. It's actually a directed acyclic graph for day. It's not a tree. Why is it not a tree? Can anyone tell me why it's not a tree? Yes, the reason. Yeah, exactly. You have uh, precisely. So you have these paths which kind of diverge here. And a tree, you know, it's going to branch and branch and branch. But it comes back together. So there's a, a cycle. Now it's it's not a cycle in a directed sense. These arrows are still pointed down, but we still call it from a cycle in the sense that it violates the tree property that you don't get things merged in. Now I'll have to share with you. It was quite a shock to me as a young computer scientist when I was yet your age. Um, I walked I walked in a younger man's shoes there, and it's it uh, shocked me one day when I saw a tree, like a, a tree outside, um, like, a, like, a, like a real tree, like an elm or something. I, I can't remember what type it was, which also violated its property. So some of the branches came back together, they stuck together. It was, it was pretty cool, actually. So uh, it violated the tree property. And um, 
still it was standing. So uh, there's there's pretty substantial sort of fusion. But anyway, I digress. Um, but we approximate trees as just branches, and it's a uh, 99.999 percent of the time it's it's accurate. But in this particular case, it was striking enough that I ended up making, showing it to lots of other people. Okay, um, so this is more complete coverage as we go up. Node coverage, which we're going to talk about first, also called state coverage, is the weakest here. And then we're going to see edge coverage is better. If you achieve edge coverage, you have achieved node coverage for reasonable assumptions. But edge pair coverage is stronger yet than edge coverage. And prime path coverage is stronger yet than it. So the further up you go, the techniques further up this achieve more coverage than the techniques below. You, you'll rule out certain bugs further up that you might have missed further down, put it that way. It's like golden stuff. Gold. So that's the idea. Where where else have you seen subsumption hierarchy in any of your classes? Can anyone tell me? I don't know if this might be a thing. What are the classes where there's subsumption hierarchy? I know many of you are third years, right? Um, so you might not have taken a course of the course, but they do appear in courses. Well, it turns out there's uh, what are called formal hierarchies of languages or machines, um, which also have this sort of uh, element. And you can think of them as kind of things produced or things consumed. But things, uh, you folks have been kind of regular expressions before. Is it 214? 214 cover that? Yeah. Um, but if you take uh, a course in fourth year on language hierarchies, or you take compilers, you'll learn about something called parsers. And they use context free grammars. And those are actually more powerful than regular expressions. They can specify things that regular expressions can't specify. And there are stronger things yet. That are called Turing machines. I don't know if you folks have heard of Turing. Um, Turing machines are an early model of computation named after their inventor, the foundational computer scientist Alan Turing, um, who was a uh, singular leader within our field in the uh, 19. Uh, 19 uh, 40s, this, this the center part of the 20th century, and unfortunately, it was terribly mistreated. Um, but uh, Turing machines uh, subsume what you can do. So anything you can do with a regular expression, you can do with a with a grammar. Um, anything you can do with a grammar, you can do with a Turing machine. And Turing machines are provably what's called universal, computational universal. So any any computation can be computed by a term. It may be a bit awkward to have this. It's kind of a, a funny con, It's kind of a funny construction. The Turing machine, uh, by modern standards, uh, it involves a tape and kind of a head that goes back and forth on this tape and a finite state machine controlling it. But any computation can be done. You know, you can have the world's most fancy algorithm that can be done on a term. Um, so that's universal. And then and there's a hierarchy there. Um, anything you can do with one, you can do with the other. Um, uh, going down, and so anything you can do with an upper level of hierarchy can achieve anything you can do below. In other words, the things below are less powerful than the things above. Um, so a uh, regular expression can't do some things that a that a, a finite state automaton, see things that are pushed on automaton or associated with a context free grammar can. Context free grammar is not as powerful as a context sensitive grammar, actually, and it's not as powerful as a term. Okay. So, subsumption hierarchies, um, they're not alone here, but this is an important subsumption hierarchy. And we're going to work our ways up. Okay. So, we're going to be talking about node coverage, edge coverage, going to give a little bit of reference to edge pair and contact. 
Okay, so these are identifying the things to be covered to sort of bring it together. These are talking about the set of things to cover nodes, states, edges, or transitions, also called edge pairs. These are the things we need to cover. Prime paths, those are the things we need to cover. We're trying to cover them. Okay. Okay, so the simplest one here is state or node coverage. Okay. Um, and the idea here is, is a very simple one. In fact, if you're running code coverage tools, this is almost certainly what it's seeking to, what it's reporting on what it's reporting. Um, the idea here is that has, through the program, uh, should reach each node in the program at least once. So it gives you the statistic about 80% coverage. It's like 80% of the nodes or states sort of areas of code in the program have been have been uh, have been reached. Okay. Um, this is the simplest and it's the weakest form of coverage. It's not as strong as edge coverage, but we're going to talk about it because covering it is a lot better than not having any principled way of exploring. So you know, if you add this, we talked about this system last time where you're buying a, an airplane ticket. Um, and you know where you have these different states it can be in where the reservation is made but it's not yet paid for or it's paid for it's made and paid for or where it's actually ticketed um and there was a long time and probably still is in some cases a uh, uh an explicit step for this and then there's different states that can get in after that like where it's canceled before payment or it's canceled after payment, or it's uh, or after being ticketed, or where it's been used. These are all different states that kind of you could be in with respect to an airline resident. Okay. Um, and state coverage would have you go through each of these states. You'd be trying one case where it's canceled by the customer, one case where it's canceled without prior to payment. Or one case where it's used. Okay, um, that's the idea. Um, or if you had a system which, and I'm trying to trying to build your knowledge on um, sort of the diversity of things you can test. This is actually a system for repair of devices. Okay, and where you have a device and it needs fixing. Maybe it's a piece of equipment. Maybe it's a you know a uh, a piece of electronic equipment for a uh, for a warehouse or what have you. So you're in a no maintenance state, or you've requested maintenance, um, and it's waiting for pickup, or um, or you know you're you're going to maintenance station and and requesting it without a warranty, uh, or there's a, uh, there's a, a repair station that's that's contacted. This is without warranty, and I think this is with warranty. Um, you, you might cover all these states uh, here where it's in these different possible situations. Um, uh, and you might take paths that would cover all those. They'd reach all of these states. So there might be certain sort of situations in which it will be routed through multiple states. And this is quite typical. You'll notice that I'm not saying you have to have a different abstract scenario or test case for each of these states. What I'm saying is you need to reach all these states at least once. And generally, a given use case through the system will reach many of these states. We saw that earlier, right? When we were dealing with this. I mean, I said, okay, so let's want to test these states. Okay. Um, a given path through this may be needed to reach this eject card state. That would hit other states too, right? Yeah, that's fine. It's achieved coverage of some other states. But let's, as an exercise, put this up there. Um, what are some abstract paths through this that collectively? 
achieve state cover. So the state so the same and rounded right back. So um give me some suggestions here. I think you can you can read this uh probably back. If you can't, you can ask me what one of these things read. But can anyone give me a couple abstract scenarios? Um you can just describe them informally where you cover all the states. Give me one to start with. Give me one to start with. Yes, Larissa. Good. Good. This is what we like to think of as offering here, right? We like. To we generally like to think about the nice case because because it's kind of why the system delivers value to people. It's through the nice case, and maybe it's a large fraction of cases or the nice case. It's why it exists is to handle the nice case. Is kind of how we think about it, um, and uh, that's how we would like to use it. So here we enter the ATM card, we prompt to the pen, it enters the pen, it checks it, prompts for transactions, we select withdraw, select the account number, things are all hunky-dory, it dispenses cash, prints the receipt, ejects the card, and goes back to welcome the print message. Great. Okay, so we've achieved what, like, I don't know, like uh, a coverage of, of uh, 10 to 12 states right there. What have we missed though? What states haven't we hit yet? Yeah, so we, we haven't hit this eject card. We hit this one, but that, that's a different state. So let's call it this guy, the top eject card state. We haven't hit that. So give me another scenario that would, would winnow down, would reduce the number of states that we haven't hit yet, that would hit some additional states. Can anyone give me a description? Yes, where is it? Yeah, okay. So enter a library card, it won't recognize it. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, so it ejects the card, hopefully, right? And hopefully that would test, it'll test this this thing. It will it will reach. Did it correctly eject the card? Right? Good. Okay, so we could kind of tick that off, right? Um, but what states have we not yet reached still? Anyone? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So can anyone give me a suggestion? Excellent. Uh, can anyone give me a suggestion for the confiscate card? Tell me a, a scenario by which it could be uh, exercise it. Riss has been on a roll, but I think uh, I'll take further back. Yes, so remind me your name. Josh. Josh, yes. Yeah, yeah, put in an expired card. Bingo. We hit the, the confiscate state. Okay, great. We still haven't hit one of the states, though, which Larissa pointed out, which is the eject card. How are we going to do that? So you notice we have three abstract states so far. Uh, yes. Uh, so dating is, uh, dating foundation have it in that case. Good. Yeah. So we we go through and we we kind of arranged it so that we're we're close or whatever, or we we enter the uh, uh mobile uh yeah we enter the amount that we want to uh to to withdraw and uh we exceed this and so it ejects the card right um. We uh uh we it it won't um it, it won't let us withdraw that amount. So now we hit that state. So collectively we had four abstract scenarios. One going through here, just through the the normal flow, the kind of trunk flow, the mainline flow, right? One that hit this state, one that hit that kind of went through and uh, mumble uh, where it's expired, and one where it went through and the daily amount was exceeded and we hit that. And those collectively hit all the states. Great. Maybe all those work. 
And uh, so those would be, when I say define a strike scenario, that's good. Now, those still aren't test cases. Test cases would, would make them very specific. How much money is in the account and what are you answering for the amount to withdraw? Because you want the testers to be able to have a reproducible test. You want it to be the same every time that it runs. So day in, day out, if it's running this test as part of the build, it's running the same darn test. If the dev is told this test broke, you want to know what particular things were being entered, right? So it needs to be very specific. So, you know, you enter the card of debt um, here, which happens to be a library card. Um, and the card of debt, you know, should enter the card of debt is capital C. The O can be lowercase, but D is capitalized. And, and that's a designated card, right? Um, okay. Um, so uh, so there's, there'd be very specific things. Those would be the test cases. But what we identified jointly was abstract scenarios. And that's where some of the most clever thinking goes in. The next stage, turning it into to particular test cases, is actually sometimes a little more tricky than you think as well. But um, like, how do you get it to go this way? But what we did was a lot of the thinking that goes into a coverage test at the at the state level. So that's great. Okay. So that's an example of state coverage. Um, now, this was at the level of the whole system. You folks have whole system. They are coming together as the entire systems. I want you to exercise similar reasoning. Yes, Larissa. Um, I know you said this before. Do you have any uh, software or like, diagrams or anything that you would have to for, for drawing this out? Yeah. Well, I mean, draw.io, I kind of like. I know in the past people have used Omnigraphle on Max, which. Um, not I'm being Linux based myself, I can't speak to, but it seemed to produce nice thingies that they showed me. Um, I mean, the output was good. I use draw.io, it's a cloud based tool that, that meshes nicely with Google Drive and so on, and has all sorts of types of diagrams. Um, uh, you know, some people well, who have Microsoft licenses, maybe it comes in through the University office license like Visio, um, you know, for these sort of diagrams. Uh, I think any of those are good. Um, I think it's, you know, I'm not going to be like super particular, like you didn't put the dot in the, in the diamond or whatever, you know. Um, I'm actually not going to be really particular. But what I would like to see is that you've actually gone through the process of systematically thinking what are the states of our system? And how could we reach them? Like what use cases would route it through here to exercise the states of our system, right? Collectively. Those would be good things to test. Notice that each of those, those abstract scenarios, in fact, exercised a bunch of the states. The very first one hit 10 to 12 states or whatever it was, you know. Um, so bear in mind, again, it's not that every scenario has to cover only one state, not far from it. It's just collectively they have to cover states. Certain states will be covered every darn time. Like this prompt for pen, almost all those three of the four scenarios, the abstract scenarios covered, hit that, come through that state. But that's fine. They were trying to cover downstream states, right? Okay. Um, so I'd like to, to see this exercise. Now, at the level of, of algorithms, if you have certain core algorithms, maybe it's one associated with risk levels for these youths at risk. Maybe it's ones associated with reasoning about, I don't know, reasoning about the um, matching up of containers and weights and, and the, the weight of the, the actual waste or something. I'm not sure. 
But if you have core algorithms, uh, you could diagram them out and basically, you know, identify the sort of areas of the code where you reach this. This is called a basic block. Once you reach it, you're going to execute all of these. Absent some error, you're going to execute all of these in a row. There's really no choice of the matter. If you reach the top of these, it's going to execute down to the bottom. If you reach the top, it's going to exercise the bottom. Up here, up here. So called basic blocks um, for that reason. They're kind of basic. They're sort of elemental. So the, the pieces from which it's it's built up. So that's node, node coverage. Um, uh, okay, what are some testing gaps for this? You know, if we go back to that case, and forgive me for, for sort of zooming back here, but if we go back to this case, what are some things like you may feel good that you hit all those states? If, if you didn't hit all those states, you'd be in bad shape, right? Like, you know, it, it, it does eject the card, you know, if there's insufficient funds. How do you know if they just can't keep on withdrawing funds? You don't know unless you test it at least once. But I'd argue that it's kind of weak. It's at the bottom of that subsumption hierarchy for a reason. Anyone want to say why? Yes. We believe. Good. Exactly. Yes. So I was a bit glib when I said, "How do we know do we do the right thing with insufficient funds?" Because Kantner's uh, idea is exactly bang on. He got to exercise the state, which is just what I asked. But, but actually, it wasn't testing that it worked correctly necessarily out of insufficient funds. It, it complained because the daily amount was exceeded. That's different from the funds being insufficient, right? Um, maybe your account doesn't allow you to withdraw more than $400 a day. But there's another case where your account has too little money for what you've requested. That would be the insufficient funds case. And we haven't tested that. All we did was sort of test under any of these. We tested for at least one of these to eject the card, but we didn't test all of them. So how do we have confidence? Or if the ATM is out of funds, right? Like, how do we know what it does if we didn't test it? Right? Um, so this is a reason I, I find it's kind of weak. What's another case we didn't really test here? So those, those four or so test cases, the abstract, they're not test cases, abstract test scenarios we came up with. What's another one we didn't test here? Yes, Lee. The card is lost. Yeah, the card is lost. We went came in this way, we confiscated the card, but we didn't come in this way. How about another one? Uh, yes, uh, Zach. Zach, okay. I, I know it's a Zach. Yeah. Okay. Um, we didn't check the board and balance here. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we didn't, we didn't exercise this path at all. And we certainly didn't try it for at least three tries. So, so what we've given it is kind of weak medicine. I mean, Again, don't get me wrong, it's, you know, it's a lot better than not testing systematically at all, but still we've left a lot of money on the table. Like there could be a lot of problems with some pretty basic functionality. So how can we do better? Well, you know, it's, it's indicated by this diagram, right? Um, we can not just cover the states, the, the nodes, we can cover the transitions between them by which we get into the state. So these are the transitions, kind of branch-like things here, right? Um, we want to test what happens if it's an invalid account associated with the card. The card's not expired, but the account is gone. You know, it's been removed or whatever. It's, the daily amount is exceeded, right? Um, insufficient funds, ATM out of funds. Um, 
We want to test each of those possible ways of transitioning into here, the particular pathways by which this could be exercised or by which the card could be confiscated. That's going to be strong. So very doable. Still something we can plan around. Still something that can be easily diagrammed. But it's it's quite a lot stronger. I'd love it if students can at least show they've achieved state coverage. Like, like if you haven't achieved state coverage, what have you been doing? You know, with testing? Because I mean, you haven't even gone to some of the screens of your app yet, like in informal tests. Of course, you want to do that. But if you can give me transition coverage, that is awesome. That's really good, or you know, that's much better, certainly. Right? Okay, so let's let's build on that idea. Um, so uh, you know, it, and it's very common at the at the level of code. The code works fine one way and flops out the other. Right? One way you're dealing with a null pointer, the other way it works fine. One way it it doesn't initialize some memory, and and the other way it does. Right? Here's an if statement. One way it allocates memory, the other way it doesn't, and it'll end up writing to a null pointer or what have you. Um, so very, very common. Uh, so edge coverage. Here we're trying to exercise each transition. Um, we saw it at the high level, we can do it at the low. Um, many task paths, again, just like many task paths covered could cover a particular state, like that enter pin state, many test paths can cover a particular edge. And for each path, for each of those paths, we have to find a specific situation that will exercise the path. Okay. Um, so again, abstract test paths we're coming up with and then we're going to have to come up with test cases, particular inputs that will allow that test path to be exercised, to be traversed, to be reached, to be realized. Okay. Um, sometimes we need to sort of scout out paths that are actually possible for which we, we can't actually get to. Um, we may see an example of that in, in just a moment. On the left. Okay, so um, with state coverage, um, you know, we had this kind of weak handling where, look, we wanted to test a case where we had a cancel by customer. And maybe we did so with the cancel case when they made it and canceled it, but we didn't after they, you know, paid it. We didn't even test this case. All we did was this is for state coverage. And what I'm saying was transition coverage, we are covering all of these, We're covering each of these, which is much stronger. Um, okay, with levels with code here, if you have code written out, this is some C code, you take it, you diagram it out. Here we identify, let's go through the steps here. Here's some C code for this routine that engages in decoding CGI encoded strings, like for URLs, plus, percent, sum, and percent. You've seen them before in URLs. And it turns that into kind of the underlying name of the file, for example, or path being accessed. Um, so first we identify the set of things we need to cover. So here's some code. Identify the things we need to cover. Well, we want to cover transitions. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to take that code and we're going to diagram it out. So we can actually see the transitions, obviously. Here we go. Mm. Um, and somehow we gotta gotta find those transitions. Right? Where are the transitions going? Anyone want to say? 
President Princess, who can point them out? Bo, is it? Bo, um, okay, yeah. So, so how do we find the term signature? Yeah, condition statement. So you can see them as kind of branches here for the most part, right? True versus false. Here's an if. That may be the main thing that's you know you have in mind with a condition statement vote, but there's also one with while, right? Well, precisely, precisely. It's there are different types of conditionals. Another one is switch, so for example. Um, and in fact, there can be some subtle ones, especially like the question mark ternary operator and colon that are also kind of serve as a conditional role. In any case, for each of these, you want to identify the possible ways that can go. You want to exercise each of that way. Um, so I know the guy who, who did this for the core algorithm of Microsoft Excel. He mapped out the entire algorithm. He mapped through what the different branches were within it. And he exercised each and every one of those branches to make sure it operated correctly, that it handled all whatever it was, 100 some odd cases or what have you. I don't remember the exact number, but it was it was a very substantive amount of, amount of work that he was testing that it reached each of these. So here you sort of highlight these. These are the things we want to cover. That's the first step uh, of the algorithm. We said we identified the things we want to cover. Now we want to identify the abstract scenarios that will get us through these things. These are from start to finish. Okay. And uh, in order to do this, we're going to need to take a look at that code again and and ask, you know, how can we achieve this coverage of these things? Um, we're going to abstract away here from the particular strings being entered and whatnot to only look at the at the sort of broad flow. So can anyone tell me? Notice that each of these rectangles is labeled with a um, with an identifier, F G. C A B. Can anyone specify for me a couple of abstract paths that will cover all of these that that you could exercise? Yes, Lee. Okay, good. So again, we're looking for paths from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So it'll be what would be the first one? A, right? Everything enters through A. Um A, B, and then if false, it'll go to M, and that's it. M is sort of the sync state, it's the entrapping state, it's the final state. So A, B, M. That's one. Okay. So that will hit that conditional. That will hit that that um edge. What's another one? So so again, we're trying to come up with these to cover all of these. So what would be another one that would help us be a step towards the the coverage of all of these? Yes, um, uh, uh, let's sit. Yes. Okay. So, so, so uh, you're on a roll. So, A, B, yeah, C, B, B, F, H, and L. Okay. Um, and you notice L is not the final one here. So you've got great beginning. The thing is that L actually is not, it's not the final state. Where does it go next? Uh, to B, and then you're on the cusp of great B and L. Look at that. Fantastic. That's kind of like a grand tour. 
So A, B, C. So when this way, this time, I'm going to compliment at least uh, with you in just a second. Theresa, uh, so B and then C, D. So it went this way from C to D. So you haven't gone that one yet. D and then F. Okay, you're going kind of, you went right, left, left. Okay. No, there's no H. Okay, it's E. So, so H is is size. So then it goes to L B F. Good call, yeah, Good call. Okay, so that's that's great. We still got some to go though, right? Okay, which ones do we still have to have? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, talk to them. Uh, B, C, E. A, B, C. A, B, C, E. Good. Uh, so you hit this one, which has been hit for these. Yeah. Uh, then uh, L. L. B. And then B. And then M. And then M. Okay. So can you read those off for me again? Uh, a, B. A, B. A, B. C. C. E. E. L. L. B, B, and that M. Awesome. Um, okay. So we had now this guy. Which which is still missing from our inventory? Anyone? Yes, Larissa. Got sharp eyes. Yeah. Do you want to go through it? <laughs> uh, so or you can just uh, tell me. G H I. Yeah. So G H and I. So we haven't hit this transition yet that goes from d into g right um and um oh my goodness that opens up two possibilities for us one h one i just like you said so so we have to we have to find a way to to, to square those so so let's go through that so a remember we are dealing with paths from the beginning we can't just hop in at the middle. So, uh, so while that's great for a quick description, what are, give me give me a path from the start to finish that would at least allow us to hit that when going into G. Yeah. A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. This is awesome. Awesome. Uh, but but uh, go a bit slower for uh, uh, for me if we could. So so A B C D uh, G H L D C D C D G I uh, G I L L M and that hit in one fell swoop. It went on a grand tour, went through all of them because it looped around twice and headed out of there and lit out of town, right? And I think that's it. I think we have covered with these abstract paths, four of them. Um, um, oh my goodness, we've covered all the transitions. And you'll notice some covered multiple ones. That's great. That's awesome. Some were covered many times. Fine. But collectively, that's covered. Now, the next stage of the out of, of this would be, of course, coming up with specific concrete test cases that are going to exercise. How are we gonna how are we gonna like bend it to our will to go this way or that way? We need to come up with some clever thing because it's not branching based on just saying, go that way, go this way. So it's branching based on conditions, like whether the end of the string has, it, whether we're at the end of the string here, whether it's it's a null value there, you know, zero value, whether it's plus this way, will tell whether it goes true or false. And so somehow we have to come up with strings, cleverly chosen, that will like get it to go this way, get it to go that way. And those will involve inputs to it here. Specific strings that we could give it that will like 
get it to route this way or get it to route that way. You'll notice these things like if it had a percent sign here or a plus here, um, whether um, the, the lower digits are minus one or, or not, whether there's like maybe a percent, I don't know, percent, um, uh, you know, uh, percent foo or something like that, where it's looking at it's expecting F looks good, you know, 15, the value 15 when decoded from hex, and then it sees an O. What the heck? What's that O doing here? You know, um, and and it bombs out and it sets this okay flag saying I'm unhappy. That's that's what this means. Um means it's an unhappy camper. So Sid, yes. Um with writing the pass. It, it, it would be the, the only, there's one time, and, and I've got to let you folks go, but there's it's a very good question. What's the advantage of doing it all in one, one test case as opposed to multiple, right? Um, would it benefit us by going through all at once? There is one downside that, that does come forward if you have it all packed into one test case. What might that be? Yes, uh, Larissa. Yeah, you might not know where it failed. It failed somewhere in this thing. And more than that, if there's some, sometimes if it if it fails earlier, it may block it, block later pass through it that would have shown other issues. If you break it into a bunch of test cases that can be run separately, you may actually find uh, quite a few of them found different types of issues. But if it's all in one, it's kind of, you know, we'll go in and stop and uh, bad things happen, you know, and, and you know, um, it blew up or whatever, and you won't have discovered the other things that same test case would have revealed, you know, uh, down the road, right? Um, and that, you know, is is going to, you know, get you in a in a pickle. Okay. Um, so, um, so generally, uh, it can be good to, to divide it up into more things rather than doing it all at once. But there are cases where it's so burdensome to have a test case that maybe it will actually help to do a couple together. And it might show other types of issues like memory leaks or something like that. If you keep on doing that and it, you know, building on that. Okay, that's all for today. Um, uh, to, we're going to be going on to discuss uh, edge pairs and um, and uh, also these this notion of prime path uh, next time. Okay, but first I get to hear your presentation. So uh, I'll meet you upstairs in about ten minutes in the room. And today, team two is going first. Okay, and they can go up and get set up if if you can, okay? Thank you very much.